All right, so let's get started. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, how many of you like Lego? Ah, almost everyone. So we are in the right room. <laughs> Um, I always loved to build Legos when I was a kid. Actually, I still love it. The idea of having the possibility to build beautiful structures, starting with a single beautiful piece, just always amazed me. I always believed that key to complexity is simplicity. One can build complex systems starting with a simple idea. Just like a beehive, it's a complex structure which we can see in nature, but it's built on a very simple idea. And simplicity is something which always attracts me. Uh, speaking about idea, trying to blend in, you know, traditional messaging system in a distributed world was not a very clever idea. You see, spending time with Lego taught me that every piece has its own place in a picture. And no matter how hard you try, how hard you try to fit one piece in place of other, it just simply doesn't fit, right? Well, that was quite obvious in Lego, but in software world, such things are not so apparent. And I was on a project where people were trying to just, you know, squeeze in the traditional messaging system in a distributed world. And that brought, you know, three major challenges in front of us. Scalability, throughput, and resiliency. So I started looking around to you know, find a piece that could fit very nicely in the distributed world and solve those challenges for us. And I stumbled upon this open source project called Kafka. Uh, but you see, I don't buy what a technology can do, rather why it can do. For me, why is very important in life. And I started asking, why Kafka is different than other messaging system? Why it is better fitted for distributed world? Why should I or anyone else even care about it? And I started my journey with all those whys, and soon I found out that Kafka was just not another messaging system. It was something more. For the starters, it supports both point and point and publish and subscribe, thanks to Kafka Journal. You see, in Kafka, each topic has its own journal. And this approach is quite different than, let's say, ActiveMQ, where messages from all the queues end up in the same journal. And if we zoom in a bit for a while, we can see that Kafka journal is nothing but a bunch of partitions, where each partition provides strong ordering guarantee. So if you write to a particular partition, Kafka guarantees that everything will be ordered in that partition. And obviously, those partitions store subset of messages, all the messages which are sent by producers. Producer can produce a you know, bunch of messages, and they get stored in various partitions. And at the end of the day, partitions in Kafka are nothing but log files. And they are keep on rolling. So you know, when one file gets filled in, Kafka opens a new log file and starts dumping data into it. And no shock that log files contain log entries. And in case of Kafka, if you see, a single log entry consists of two parts. First is a message length, which is four bytes, uh, and then um, the actual message bytes representing the message. And those names you see like 347.kafka or 8 to 7, they are not randomly generated. They follow some predefined schema, and basically they are generated based on the offset of the first message. Uh, which is contained in that log file. The next thing that blew me away was that Kafka is always on system. And hitting scalability wall with Kafka is virtually impossible. I mean, there are some companies that are doing some serious amount of message crunching using Kafka. On top of it, Kafka promotes you know, the data movement, make data accessible again. It made easy for me to import and export existing data. And that was quite handy when you are introducing a new system in your um, existing landscape. Then I started to look around architectural uh, design from Kafka. And uh, I was quite happy, because the inspiration was coming more from the storage system like HBase, Cassandra, HDFS, comparing to traditional messaging system. 
And that was a nice sign. And on top of everything, it was able to order a strong ordering guarantee comparing to a traditional messaging system. Let me explain a bit what I mean this strong ordering guarantee than a messaging system because messaging ex system exists from a while. So let's say we have a queue on a server where we have a bunch of records. Um, obviously, records are in order on the server. So as they arrive on a server, queue stores them. And on the right, we have a bunch of consumers. And these consumers want to read from this queue, obviously in parallel. And you see, the server starts to hand out records in order as they were stored on the server. However, the records are de delivered asynchronously, meaning they may arrive out of order on the consumers. So it is possible that you know, record one will arrive at C2, then record zero and record two. So as you can see, the ordering guarantee get lost. A common workaround which is found to address this solution in the messaging uh, with traditional messaging system is the notation of exclusive consumer. So till now I was able to figure out that well, Kafka know its game and it's definitely excel at its messaging capabilities. However, what made me to invest you know, my day and night with Kafka was simply because it's better than mom. And by mom, I didn't mean my mom. I mean message-oriented middleware. So if you take a look on message-oriented middleware and Kafka, first thing you will find is the fundamental difference. Mom takes broker-centric approach, meaning it's the responsibility of the broker to track and delete messages as they get consumed. It sounds easy, right? However, messenger tracking is much trickier than it looks. So a broker needs to maintain a lot of states just to track a single message. So it needs to know when to send, when the message is acknowledged, when to delete it, and all this is a, you know, a serious amount of work which a broker needs to do. So message tracking is not so easy. Uh, Kafka, on the other hand side, changed the game. It say, well, I'm going to take client-centric approach, meaning you know, it, the clients are smart and the brokers are dumb. So you have a very lightweight broker. Most traditional messaging brokers are built with index structures. Well, the downside of these index structures, such as Btree or Hashtable, they use them, is that they must be kept in memory in order to get a good performance. Well, with Kafka, it is based on log structure and you don't have such restrictions. Moreover, what happens when you have you know, messages which are just coming in the system and you stop consuming them? or maybe you want to keep them for X amount of time. Well, they start to pile up, right? And as they start to pile up, what happened with traditional broker is things starts to slow down. So then more messages starts to pile up, the traditional messaging brokers, their performance goes slow and slow and slow. Kafka, you know, its architecture was designed from HBase and Cassandra and s systems like that, basically storage systems. So retention was not an issue from day one. Finally, in case of outrage, when you have, you know, two in the night alarms uh, going on, uh, with mom, things tends to become significantly slow down. Everything slows down. It's like you are watching YouTube in 0 0.25. You know, everything is going like that. With Kafka, you barely notice such hiccups. So, you know, Kafka made sense to me, it able to answer why, and now I was more interested in how Kafka does all this thing, because it's very important to understand how Kafka is able to, you know, blend in in the infrastructure and how it does all those nice things behind the scene. And the answer was simple. It's immutability. And I like to put it like this, that if simplicity is the soul of efficiency, then immutability must be the body. What Kafka did is it took the simplicity, immutability, blend it together to create something called log structure. Because at the end of the day, Kafka is nothing more than a distributed tape log. And it's built using this log structure. And this log structure works like this. So the write goes at the end of the file. So every time when you write, the writes will happen at the end, at the end, at the end. And when you want to read, you can just simply do a single seek and scan. 
we are 10 minutes in the talk and I don't know if you figure it out, but I'm from India. And in my culture, we have believe a lot in karma. So last time when I was in India, I decided to visit a restaurant of my friend called Karma. Um, she invited me many times, but for some reasons, I could never make it to her restaurant. And I decided to take mom with me. This time I mean my real mom, the one which you saw on the photo, not message-oriented middleware. And um, so we went there, we sat on a table, um, and like 10 minutes passed and there was no menu on the table. So I went to my friend and I politely asked her, I said, hey, can I get the menu card, please? And she said, well, you see, dear, you are in a karma restaurant, there is no menu, you get what you deserve. Hardware and log, they share the same karmic relation. Log is your good karma, and performance is what you deserve. So let's take a look how Kafka does all its performance stuff. So scalability, the log structure can span across many machines, because at the end of the day, log is just files, and this can span on many machines easily, no problem, and it makes Kafka highly scalable. Obviously, Kafka needs to you know, um, make sure that things are stitched together in order to make everything work in one piece, but Kafka takes care of that, and we're gonna take a look in a couple of slides how. Not only that, we can also scale the reads by performing reads in parallel. So let me show you how that happens. So let's say we have a topic. It can be a payment topic, and it have two partitions in the beginning. So what can happen is we can have a consumer which is reading in the beginning from both partitions. So it is taking some messages from partition zero, some from partition one, and processing. We found out after some time, we say, well, you know, this process is a bit slow because we want to, let's say, process the things in much more faster way. What we can do is we can add a new consumer, C2, and Kafka is going to take care to assign half of the partition to this new consumer. So half of two is one, so that's why the Kafka assign partition, one partition to consumer two. Under the hood, what happens is much more interesting. When Kafka consumer C2 join, the moment it joined the consumer group, an internal uh, partition rebalance get triggered in Kafka. So what happens is the group leader need to um, decide which partition should be handled by which consumer. And it use, you know, um, partition assigner interface, um, default range is the range partitioning is the default implementation. Anyhow, it need to figure out all this information, like which partition should be handled to which consumer. It figure out this information and it hand over to the group coordinator. And group coordinator propagate this information to all the consumers. The same thing happens when you add a new partition. So when you add a new partition, the same thing happens. The Kafka is going to take care to assign new partition to existing consumers using partition rebalancing. And you don't have to worry about all these things if you are coding your application. Kafka does it for you. But under the hood, there is you know, partition rebalancing happening. The second thing which uh, we would like to take a look is throughput. I mean, Kafka has an impressive and massive throughput. And I mean it when I use the word impressive and massive. It just blew me off uh, with its throughput capabilities. And it doesn't achieve it by importing the things into JVM, because if it will import in JVMs, you know, it have to pay the GC penalties and all that stuff. And it also doesn't even import messages or buffer them to user space. So what it does, well, it's quite smart. It relies on the shoulder of giant. So it uses kernel level IO, which means it can copy data directly from the disk to the socket. And this is it right in front of you, the recipe to saturate your network bandwidth. So basically Kafka can send message as much bandwidth as you have. And it's quite smart because it, it is just using kernel level IO. Um, this is also called zero copy. And if you are interested how, how to access such stuff, you know, you can take a look on Java um, documentation. There is a message called transfer to on Linux. Um, caching plays a very crucial role, especially um, you know, when you have a highly scalable system. And 
Kafka relies again on the shoulder of giants. So rather than you know building its own in-memory cache or you know some other fancy caching structure, what it does is it says, well, operating system know its work, and I will rely on the page cache. And the page cache always stays warm and nice, even if a service is restarted. So let's say you have a service, it is talking to the you know to a machine where Kafka is running, and the, you know your service just blew off for some reason. And in a normal application, what you have is you need to think about, oh, how I will, you know, restore my cache. But with page cache, everything is at the, you know, cache by the operating system. So the cache is there, nice and warm, ready to be served. One of the key important things when you are building, uh, you know, event-driven architecture is, you know, exactly once processing especially if you are doing some stream processing or stuff like that, which basically means that, uh, you know, an event X should be considered consumed if and only if Y is produced successfully. Uh, let me break what I mean by that. So let's say, you know, you have a John who is transferring $1 million to, I don't know, his girlfriend, Maria. You want this thing to happen only once. You don't want twice by mistake. Because if that happened, Maria is super happy and John is going to die with heart attack. So you want to make sure that events are processed one. This thing comes super, um, let's say, important if you are dealing in a financial domain. And you may ask, well, hold on for a second. Where the duplication comes from the first place? Well, let me show you. So we can have a producer who is writing a bunch of messages to Kafka. Then let's say a network problem happens. Why it happens? Well, you know, network problems happen all the time. We have to deal with them. And at this point, the producer sent the messages. They were written by Kafka, but the acknowledgement was not received due to network problem. So producer is going to say, hey, the messages were lost, so I'm going to retry and send these messages once again. And that's where the duplicate starts to sneak in. Kafka solved this problem using item, uh, item potent producer, but that's not the full story. When you are consuming the messages, you can also have duplicates. How? So in consumer, remember the mantra, you know, dumb broker, smart consumer? So when a consumer read a message from Kafka, what happens is it asks for a bunch of message to the broker, it process those message, and then it says to the broker, well, I have read those messages. So it sends the offset, basically. So it get the message, process them, and say, okay, I process 10 messages, and I send this info back to the broker. And it's written in the internal Kafka topic as well. However, let's say that in this case, consumer fetch some messages, process it, and then consumer crash for some reason. So the process died. In that case, you know, what's going to happen is any other consumer who is going to overtake the part of or, or the place of this consumer is going to process from the place where consumer left the last time, meaning again we have duplicates here. So um, this is the source of duplication happening in event-driven architecture. So Kafka transactions are basically meant to nail this problem. And what it does is basically you have producer, and producer first needs to find the transaction coordinator. <laughs> and then it needs to, um, so first it needs to find the transaction, uh, first it needs to find the transaction coordinator, because transaction coordinator is a module running in each and every Kafka broker. So the first thing it does is it asks the broker, hey, can you give me a transaction coordinator? And the broker finds it and hands it over to him. And then the producer says, well, let's exchange some request with the transaction coordinator. It says, well, I want to initialize some transaction, the transaction coordinator write in its transaction log, which is nothing but an internal Kafka topic. It writes that, okay, you are in a, I initialize a transaction for you. It gives thumbs ups to the producer. Producer call begin transaction. It start dumping its messages to Kafka partitions. And then after a while, it says, well, I'm done. So at that point, what happened, transaction coordinator is going to commit the record 
it, it is going to prepare the transaction to be committed. It commits the transaction and then it writes the marker messages. The idea behind marker message goes way back like 30 years or something and these two awesome guys, they describe it in snapshot marker model, um, this idea. So if you are interested, just read this, uh, this paper as well. Uh, one thing to know is that in distributed world, everything is based on time. So if something is started, it must end at some point. So what happens if producer, for example, started a transaction and it, for some reason, is not want to finish it? Well, the transaction coordinator is not going to wait forever for it, and it will just abort the transaction. Um, one thing which you need to be aware is that consumers, you need to set the isolation level properly in order to read the committed message. Because what happens is, in Kafka, the transactions are implemented not as JTA transaction or stuff like that. They are just super lightweight transactions. Meaning, when you write the messages, the consumer are buffering them uh, for a given pro uh, pr uh, producer ID and until they receive commit or abode. So meaning, uh, if you don't specify this isolation level, you can still read the uncommitted messages in Kafka. Resiliency is super important in distributed world. And for a system like Kafka, which have to scale at such a massive scale, it's a paramount importance. And Kafka relies on its rock solid replication protocol. I mean, this is really a solid stuff of engineering, which they, they, they put their mind and heart into. And leader election process is also cool. So Kafka doesn't use algorithms like Zab or um, majority vote based journal. They are, I mean, these are nice algorithms, but they are aimed more towards, you know, problems where um, you don't have such huge data volumes. That's why Zookeeper use Zab, because Zookeeper at the end of the day, what it have to do is store some uh, configuration metadata and stuff like that. Whereas with Kafka, we are speaking here about, you know, huge volumes of data. That's why Kafka use its own algorithm and it's used the leader election process based on uh, ISR, which I will show you in a couple of slides. Uh, and uh, also, thanks to uh, replication, it can avoid the, making the sync calls. Um, you will be thinking, well, hold on for a minute. Where these sync calls come at the first place? Why and why it is avoiding them? So let's, let's have a very, you know, super fast journey to how the write works at OS level or at a disk level. So when you have a file system and file system want to write, let's say, foo to disk, it is not directly written to the disk. What happens is first it's written to buffer cache. And after a while, it hits the next level of caching. And this time at the hardware level in the form of disk driver controller. Then it moves to, well, the last level of caches, and these caches exist on the disk themselves, both the SSD and, and you know, the, the other ones. Well, and these caches on the hardware level, they come at, in, in two forms, like write through or write back. And finally, our data reaches to disk. So as you can see, writing to a file, by file system to a disk is not a one-step process. Obviously, you can do it in one step by making a sync call, but then be prepared to pay the price for, because it's going to be you know, slow process. And why operating system, you know, we have the cache at you know, OS level and at the hardware level? Why is that? To make our life easier. Because talking to disk is like, you know, quite an expensive operation. It's like, you know, calling to international calls back in 50s. You have to pay a lot of price to make even a single call. And that's why what operating system or hardware does is it's try to, you know, group the small writes together so it can flush in one go to the disk. Um, so basically Kafka avoids all that stuff and it say, well, I'm not going to call the sync call. I'm going to rely on my replication to provide the resiliency. So let's take a look on how replication works in Kafka. So in Kafka, replication ha happens at topic level or shall I say partition level because it happens at the partition level because at the end of the day, partition is nothing but a replicated log. Yeah. So 
let's say we want to replicate a topic uh, or replicate a partition P0 three times. So we write P0 and it gets replicated three times. Speaking about replication, always there is going to be someone who will be a leader and someone going to be a follower. And the same happens in Kafka. One of them is a leader and others are followers. But the semantics of leader in Kafka works like this. That producer talks only to the leader, meaning all the rights go to the leader. And then it's the responsibility of the leader to propagate those rights to other replicas. And finally, it, when all the things are replicated nicely by replicas, it commits the message. And if that time you just dig into your Kafka server, what you will see is some info like this. The important bit is the ISR. What this ISR BC means? Well, it basically means if for some reason A blew off, B or C can take the position of A because B and C holds the same data. What, part, uh, what A is holding on. But keep in mind, not always, you know, all replicas will be in sync replica. So here is another example. And producer is writing here a bunch of records. And, you know, on replica B, we are able to replicate everything as it is. But when we are replicating to C, C is not dead, but it is slow to replicate. And to detect such thing plays a very important part in replication algorithms because uh, the leader is not going to wait forever because if it waits forever the resiliency is going to suffer right so what it's going to do it will say hey see you are slow enough so i'm not going to wait for you i'm going to remove you from the list of in sync replica and one thing to note is not all the partitions have to live on the same broker in Kafka, or all the leaders have to be on the same brokers. So what I mean is, let's say we have another partition, P1, and we want to replicate it. it it's not like that the leader will always be on broker zero for some reason. Kafka just even use here the possibility to distribute leaders in such a way that you know the system will be up and running as much as possible. So you can have, for example, leader for partition one at broker one, and maybe you added a partition two and the leader will be at broker two. So leaders happen at per partition level. And um, the final part uh, which, which I would like to discuss here is about Kafka and event sourcing. So um, this is quite, quite a stuff which you know everyone speaks about. And um, there are even a post on the same platforms. One saying, well, you can use Kafka for event sourcing. Others saying, no, you can't use it for event sourcing. And if you look at the Twitter, you will find you know, tweets saying, yes, it is good. And other tweets are saying no and all that stuff. Yeah. So um, I try to give it a spin, uh, Kafka for event sourcing. And let's see where, wh what happened at the, you know, at, at the level when you touch it to make money out of that. So, first of all, how many of you know event sourcing? Okay, uh, so a small, like, one minute recap uh, of event sourcing. Basically, event sourcing is a way of creating an applications where events are the source of the truth. So, meaning, let's say if I ask you, hey, what is your salary? You go and look in your database and you say, well, I make 10,000 pounds. In event sourcing, what is going to happen is it will say, well, you know, your salary is plus 1,000, plus 5,000, plus 2,000, minus 500. So it's everything is in the form of events. So events are the source of the truth. And um, there are some semantics to use anything in event sourcing, right? So the first thing is that events need to be ordered. You don't want a player to withdraw money before it's even registered in the system. And in Kafka, you can do that thing easily, yeah? What you can do is you can say, well, since each and every partition is ordered in Kafka, what I can do when I'm writing, I can write based on aggregate identifier. So how the write works in Kafka is, when you are writing in Kafka, you can specify a key, message key. If you don't specify it, 
it is going to pick something from random. It is going to generate a random key. But if you pick it, then it will say, okay, it have a key and it will end up in this bucket. So by this way, you are making sure that all the records are going to end up in the same bucket. Hence, you have an ordering guarantee. So far, so good. The second thing which you need in event sourcing thing is event replay. So which means, you know, you should be able to go back in the history and consume all those events. You may ask, well, why I need to go back in the history and events? Well, machine learning and big data, your two big brothers and sister who want to go back and consume and recommend you. Everything, everything, everything. Uh, and you can do that easily with log. You know, you can just replay the log and Kafka have a very impressive, as, as we already saw, um, performance when it comes to uh, replaying. Retention and durability, you don't want you know, to lose all that years of data for some reason. And as we see, like with Kafka, retention is not a problem. And even if you want to store years of data, you can always offload to a cheaper storage like S3, for example, and just download the log files when you need in on demand. Um, the final part is like event store and projections. So can Kafka be used as an event store and projection? This is what it boils down because it fulfills to check mark all these three things. And what is an event store? Well, it store events, a simple definition. <laughs> but let's take a look on the semantics. So event store should do three things. It should do mainly these three things. First, it should be able to write super fast. It, and when it is writing, it should also be able to validate the sequence numbers. Why? Because you know things can exist on two different boxes and you want to validate when you are writing the thing. And also it should be able to load aggregates, which, which means in this sense that let's say if out of all these grapes, I want to find you know this uh, bluish, all the blue grapes. Uh, from the system. So it should be able to go all the, you know, all the partition and find all those grips and load the aggregate. And that's what my aggregate loaded looks like. So what's missing in Kafka is identity and concurrency control. And also the mechanism to load the aggregates, specific aggregates efficiently. Because, you know, on the same partition, you can have events from many, many, many aggregates. And if you just bluntly replay, it will take some time for you. And there is no built-in support in Kafka for that. And that's a good reason, because that's what, what I like about Kafka. H however, remember that Kafka can be viewed as a database inside out. So what I mean is, if you take a look on traditional database, a traditional database is nothing but it contains, you know, query engine, commit log, indexes, caching, all these things, components bunched together, you know, and packed in a black box. Kafka on the other hand side says, well, I can be a database inside out. So what you can do is you have a commit log and you can start gluing various different parts like Kafka streams, KSQL and stuff like that. And you can then start creating the same things what traditional database offers. So for example, you can create the views and cache. And um, using this picture in our mind and keeping it, we can try to answer those questions. So first thing is identity and concurrency control. So in order to solve this problem, we can do two things. First is we can use something like optimistic concurrency control, which means basically we put something in front of Kafka, which takes care of making sure that no duplicate happens, so some, some database or something. Or we can also use single writer principle, which basically means that you know only one writer will be writing to Kafka. And uh, that solves the identity and concurrency control problem. And what about these aggregates and projection? Well, you can use Kafka streams for that. Basically, for those of you who are not aware about you know, what these aggregates and this is, I don't want you to just you know, sit here and, 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 and just be lost. Well, basically, when you go to a database, you say, hey, I want to get some bunch of information to render on, on, on the web page, yeah? 
So you don't render um, the full table from the database. You render bits and piece and bit, pieces and bits from them. And that's what Kafka Stream helps. Kafka Stream can help you to create those views, basically, which you can use, you know, and serve the data to the users. And those things get updated. So when new events come, Kafka Stream updates itself. And if you use Kafka Streams, and, and, and I try to build projections using them, and it looks something like this. So you can have a service, and you can have your business logic. Then you have a Kafka Stream, and Kafka Stream can just consume all the events and build. So for example, here, I can say, I don't know, go through Bob, Do, Bob, all those events, and find how much money we have total in the wallet, or maybe create a wallet for Bob. And Kafka Stream is good at it. However, there are some things which you need to care about. And that comes the learnings from production. So in Kafka, Kafka Streams use the concept of local store, which means that if you write something to Kafka, it's write, it will write on this local store if you are using Kafka Streams cache. And that is super good and super fast. However, you, in, or, in order to make sure that, you know, if local, did, local store blew up, the Kafka will still be up and running and your streams will not be broken, it tried to back up all those things. And it back up in so-called change log topic. Um, obviously, the compaction is enabled there. I mean, where I'm heading with all this information for you? That's the question. So basically, if you are doing that stuff, you need to make sure that your ops department are aware of it because it's going to put some additional pressure on your Kafka cluster. And Kafka can handle it pretty fine, but you need to just cater for all those stuff in the beginning. Um, so what we learned during this process when trying to use Kafka uh, with a, as a messaging system is First of all, um, be conscious. Um, be conscious in life is a, is a good thing, but be conscious, super conscious when you are deleting um, data from Kafka. Because in our case, you know, one of the engineers just use integer.max value and he just put there and he said, well, it's big enough, you know, who the hell, you know, it's, it, it will last. Well, after a few, few months, we, we, our things were gone, you know, terabytes of data disappear. And then we were debugging like crazy, what the hell happened? Uh, obviously, we had a backup of the data, but that caused some, some additional pain. Um, if you are deploying Kafka on a shared storage, then remember that your neighbors can be chatty. So if your neighbors are chatty, it can impact your performance as well, because Kafka relies heavily on the disk. For Kafka, disk is, 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 is part of its DNA. You know, so if someone disturbs it, the full body is gonna disturb. Um, this is something which is super important to keep in mind because with great powers come great responsibility. And network throttling is something if you don't set the quotas, that can set you back with like denial of service. So what happens, for example, if you introduce a new broker in a system, you know? And you say, well, everything will be faster because now I'm adding one more piece of box. Well, yeah, but if you haven't set a quota, it will start to replicate all the data. And what it's going to do, it will take all the bandwidth, meaning leaving your cluster in a, you know, a bit of shaky state. And you can uh, remember to enforce quotas. And the same goes when you are, someone is developing service with Kafka. They need to, you need to give them some quotas so they don't throttle and take all the bandwidth. Um, and when you add a new broker, it doesn't mean that existing topic data is moved to this broker. So it can be possible if you have a hot topic in a system and you are saying, well, I will resolve this issue by adding a new broker. Well, the broker is going to stand like this. It's not going to do anything for the existing topic. What you need to do is you need to move the partitions to this broker. And you can do with the script which comes with Kafka. Um, finally, if you are uh, trying, you know, aggregates and all that stuff, you have to basically enable the compaction because it doesn't really make sense to have uncompacted topic for aggregates. And finally, like, don't use kill command to, to, to do the slow, um, to do the shutdown. Uh, 
So the before Kafka 1.1.0, the problem was that you know there were synchronous writes happening to Zookeeper when you wanted to do the control shutdown, and also the communication overhead with leaders was quite a lot when the shutdown was happening. And Kafka resolved this problem using 1.1.0 and just upgraded. In our case, the engineer just you know couldn't wait for some time and he just killed the cluster and then you know everything runs to you know ashes. So um, how Kafka helped us to go through and, and solve those three challenges? So first thing is Kafka is always on. You know, <laughs> taking Kafka down is super hard. It's like you know those fighter planes which were introduced in World War, which will you know can make back home even if its you know windshield is gone and you know fire on the tail, it will still make way back home. That's how Kafka is. Kafka can able to run and run and run. So it's really hard to take it down. Second is it's designed from the distributed world, means it takes a lot of engineering and overhead, um, which we had to do uh, to design, but they, they did for us, basically, in terms of solid replication protocol and um, taking the scalability out from the equation. Uh, finally, I like to see like Kafka as a database inside out, and uh, it's fun to play Lego, isn't it? So Kafka can be think, thought as a as a piece of Lego which you can use in your distributed systems in various different ways, as a messaging system or something else. So um, I think I have left enough time for the questions. So thank you very much for your time.